Welcome to Expat Your Life. My name is Abram. I'm bringing you stories of travelers and expatriates from all around the world to inspire and motivate you to travel more or even to leave your home country and become an expat in a different country. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because it's something that I struggled with uh, when I was making the first journey and I want to make it easier for those of you that are thinking about doing it. Uh, today, I'm interviewing Lee. Lee is a really good friend of mine who will be telling us his story of how he became an expat and giving you tips and tricks uh, and advice of how to do it yourself. So without further ado, let's go talk to Lee. Hello everyone, my name's Lee. Uh, I'm from Boston. I've been abroad now for about close to five, six years. I've lived in you know, a few places around the world and yeah, it's just, it's been the most rewarding experience of my life. You know, it's literally, I'm living my dream. Like, I have a really amazing story to share with you guys and I'm really looking forward to doing it. So, uh, there are some places in the world that I just want to share with you that I've been, that have been so amazing, like that are on everyone's bucket list to see. I've been to the Taj Mahal in India. I've been to Halong Bay in Vietnam. Obviously, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, I've seen the Sydney Opera House. You know, I've been to uh, Beijing, Tiananmen Square. You know, um, Beijing, uh, Hong Kong, seeing the skyline from Victoria, um, Mount Victoria, the big mountain, seeing the whole skyline. It's amazing. Um, in the gorge in, tai in Taiwan. Massive, massive gorge you can just drive through. It's like a big canyon in the middle there. It's amazing. Uh, in Cebu, Philippines, I went and did canyoneering there. It was a great travel experience. Jumping off cliffs, cliff diving. There's no rush that you feel than just taking a leap of faith off the 10 meter high or 15 meter high cliff. Such a rush of experience. Uh, I've been all over Europe, I've seen uh, Big Ben. Uh, you know, I've been to Berlin. Berlin was amazing, where, you know, you see all the, the Berlin Wall and the war remnants and seeing what, how the, the German people take all the ruins and turn them into really cool cafes, bars, and all this stuff. It's incredible, man. I've uh, been to the south of France, my first trip to France, and seeing the French Riviera, Monaco. It was incredible. Panama Canal, obviously. Um, where else? In Spain, the Sagrada Familia. And, like, Barcelona, in Madrid, uh, in Switzerland, I went to Zurich, Lake Zurich, beautiful, beautiful lake there that you can see. Um, Thailand, obviously all the amazing temples, and Asia in general, all the amazing temples and sites there. Um, yeah, man, there's just so much of this world that you see on pictures, on Instagram, and things that you can just see in person, and it's it's so much better. You have such a more amazing experience, and it's like you're ticking off Boss. It helps you realize your next dream, your next goal. The most amazing place by far that I've ever been. The most amazing travel experience I've ever had is going to Everest Base Camp. I'll never forget, like I just got reminded on Facebook of a post that I made six years ago where I took a picture, or yeah, seven years ago, I took a picture of a fortune cookie uh, that said, one day you will be standing on top of the world. And it was so eerie because it was one day before I had reached Everest Base Camp six years later. And I was like, holy crap. You know, I remember sitting there looking at it like, I am, I am going to do this. I am going to go to the top of Everest Base Camp one day in my life. And then, you know, just last year, I was like, I couldn't go, for some reason, I couldn't go on a vacation with my fiance. She wanted to go do something in America. So I thought, okay. I'm going to go to, this is the best time for me to do this. I have enough money to do it. I'm going to do it. And it was only, I think, the whole trip cost me like maybe two grand. The, the actual trek itself cost me like 1100 bucks, and I saved three weeks in the park. And I was like, 
Yeah, I'm gonna do it. It was in the middle of winter, so it was very cold, and it was off season, so there's no one else there. There were at times where we were the only ones staying in the tea house. You know? So I was like, yeah, this is the best time for me to do it, and it was the most amazing experience. I I saw uh, obviously all the Himalayas. You know, traveling into uh, Lukla Airport was the scariest experience in my life. The plane was going, a small propeller plane was going like this, and uh, when you reach Lukla Airport, like it's at an incline, like this. So it's very scary, you know, traveling at that speed, you know. And, uh, so. The whole trek lasted 14 days in freezing cold temperatures. I remember sleeping in a sleeping bag, freezing my, my ass off, and it was like uh, negative 29 degrees in my base camp. Yeah, negative 29 degrees Celsius, so it's even colder in Fahrenheit. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a really rewarding experience. I learned a lot about myself in terms of what my limit was. And uh, yeah, you just when you see Everest for the first time, it's just like, wow, you're realizing a dream. You know? And uh, it helped me realize what's next in life. Where else do I want to go? When you reach that point where you reach your lifelong dream, it's like, what's next? So I think it's very important to do all the things in life that you dream to go do because you only have one chance to do it. I've lived in Australia and also now living here in Vietnam. Uh, you know, that's. Australia was the first place that I lived in um, after you know, leaving from the U.S. Um, and when I was done in Australia, I moved to Vietnam after. First started in Hanoi, and now I'm living here in Ho Chi Minh City. I have a lot of motivation, you know. So uh, you know, living in America, you know, I grew up in Boston. And uh, I went to school, uh, you know, up there and everything. I finished my university studies. And yeah, I uh, got sick of the cold, you know, up in Boston. So I decided after, you know, uh, university, I was going to move to Miami. And so I packed up all my stuff, got in my car, said goodbye to all my family and friends, drove all the way down to Miami. And yeah, it was, I got a job right away there. I started working at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, the management training program there. And it was tough, man. It was really tough. You know, I was I was working like 50, 60 hours a week. And I was like, God damn, man, I'm working like a dog, you know? And they have this scheme where you try and work your way up to assistant manager, manager, you can become regional manager. They sell you that American dream, you know, making your way to the top, running your own business. You know? So I was like, I was really sold on it, you know? I studied management and I wanted to become a manager. I worked my ass off for two and a half years doing it, you know? It got to the point where I was like, I'm in this beautiful place, you know, I lived in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida at first, and I was like, wow, I can't enjoy any of it. So I tried to find something, another job, where I could enjoy my life and the scenery. So I started working at a ballet company as a manager. That was good, but the hours were crazy, you know, and I still I felt like I couldn't enjoy as well either. So. I got a 40, like it was a little bit less than the Enterprise gig, it was, instead of 60, 70 hours a week, it was 50 hours a week, working as a recruiter. And I did that for a year and, and a half, I think, and it was better, because I had some more free time. But yeah, man, it's, it's just, the culture in America, when it comes to work, is very cutthroat, it's very, uh, how do I say it, it's very ruthless, you know what I mean? So. After realizing that, you know, I started, um, you know, looking for ways out. I started, uh, you know, following a lot of travel bloggers on Instagram, on Snapchat, on YouTube, you know, watching travel bloggers. Like, wow, man. I really, really enjoy, you know, watching their content. And I saw, like, this one guy, his name was Drew Binsky. He has an Instagram, a Snapchat, you know, YouTube channel. I was like, this guy's younger than me. He's living abroad. You know, he's, his life is fantastic. You know? It's just like, I'm sitting there at my desk and I'm like, why can't that be me? I felt like I, I could do exactly what he was doing. It didn't seem like it was too difficult. 
Um, and you know, I had met when I when I got to Robert uh, the recruitment job, I had moved down to Miami, and I had met my roommate there. Um, he was this guy who worked online. He was like a digital nomad. Not digital nomad, but like he, he had a remote job. He was a very interesting guy. Still talk to him to this day. His name's Aaron. Uh, he used to, we got started talking and uh, he said that he spent six years in China. You know, he was a black guy just like me. You know, he spent six years in China. And uh, he spoke, spoke fluent Chinese. I was like, wow, this guy's really interesting. And I, I'll never forget, the day that I moved in, he was like, yeah, man, so um, this is the place. This is great. You know, um, we're in downtown Miami, blah, blah. Sometimes, though, I have guests stay here for free. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, sometimes, you know, they, they stay for free. And, uh, you know, we get to meet a lot of people. Who sometimes we take them around. Um, they come from all over the world. Like, what? Why wouldn't you charge them? So no, this is a thing called couchsurfing. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, interesting. So I looked up on the website and yeah, couchsurfing was very interesting, man. Uh, people stay at your place, uh, you host them, you take them around, and you meet people from around the world. Yeah. And I felt, well, if I can't travel, I might as well, you know, meet people from around the world. So yeah, I, uh, you know, I moved in there and we started hosting a lot of couchsurfing. And I met some really interesting people. We hosted about 40 people in my in the place in Miami. And then I met some friends, and they had invited me to go on a trip with them for Thanksgiving to um, Panama. And that was the first time that I had left the United States to go abroad. Oh, hello. Hello. How are you? Yeah, so, so yeah, um, I had went on a trip to Panama with them, and it was a really eye-opening experience. Because, uh, <laughs> because I had never been outside of the country before. The only time I had been was Canada, and that was very, um, it was too similar to U.S. But anyways, uh, they use the American dollar there, and... Yeah, I just I got a glimpse of how travel, how fun travel could be, and how cheap it could be. You know, and like I spent like a week there over Thanksgiving, and I was like, wow, I could do this. I can actually do this. You know, we had so much fun. We went to um, Panama City. We went to the canal. We went up and down like mountains. We stayed in a homestay in a valley. It was a really rewarding experience. And I was like, I can do this. You know, so yeah, that's how. When I went back to my job, my recruitment job in Miami, I was like sitting at my desk and I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like this is, this is not the life I want to live. You know, I had such a rewarding and amazing experience being abroad. It's like if this guy drew and other people can do it, why can't I? You know? So that's how I started.
I had saved up 10 grand. I reached my goal, but then I actually had to pay money in order to get out of my loan. So I had to sell it at a price that was cheaper, you know? So yeah, that was that was tough, but yeah, I started saving, you know? That was, the, you have to have a goal in mind, and then really believe that you can reach it in order to get there. And that's what I did. I sold everything, and worked my ass off, saved every single penny, and I did it. Um, it's a huge sacrifice, but I would do it again. Alright, so after I saved it up, I was like, alright, I gotta start and apply for a visa. Right? So I was thinking of many different places where I could go, and I had heard about the working holiday visa in Australia. So the first step that I did was apply for that visa. I'll never forget the day that I got the email, and it said, Congratulations, you've been approved for a working holiday visa. I was like, oh my god, this is actually happening. Um, then I tried to devise a plan in order to tell my my company that I was leaving. I ended up not telling them I was leaving. I told them I was going to go back to Boston for Thanksgiving and that, yeah, I would be coming back after. But yeah, I left my company. I left my company on a trip to Boston, but then I bought a one-way ticket to Paris. My, my my, uh, I guess my my goal was to go through Europe, then travel through Asia, and then finally end up in Australia. So I told them I was going on a trip, and yeah, I never came back. Uh, I had people move for like a month or two after, and yeah, it was it was crazy because I remember sitting in the airport in Boston, with my passport and the ticket that said Paris on it. I was like, wow, this is scary, man. Because you give up everything you've ever known. You gave up everything you've ever known in Boston, you know, in, in the U.S. And that whole lifestyle that you have there, it's just like a new chapter in my life was starting. And so, it was a really good experience, man. You know, I, I was so happy to finally land in Paris. It was scary. It was scary. I didn't... I, I knew a little French, but I knew that my journey was going to take me to other countries where I didn't know the language. So that was cool. But yeah, I, I traveled the first. I landed in, in France, then I went to the Netherlands, then I went to uh, Spain. Uh, what else? Uh, I think a couple other countries in Europe in that first Euro trip. And I finally circled back to Paris. And I was like, wow. Paris was some place that I really wanted to go to my whole entire life. My mom, uh, you know, told me about Paris when I was a kid, and uh, you know, she said that she had been there. She had learned French, you know, and she told me lots of great stories. And she was part of my motivation to learn French in the first place in school. Uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. My my mom passed away when I was 16. And uh, I actually was a foster in foster care uh, throughout my teenage years. And statistically, you know, foster children rarely go to college and rarely even graduate college. I graduated with, you know, a four-year degree and yeah, I'm living abroad now. And so anything is possible to put your mind to. Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah. Um, get back to it so like it was a really emotional experience for me to see the Eiffel Tower for the first time and to be there you know I remember asking some lady to take a picture of me in front of the Eiffel Tower and I was crying after you know I was like I, I'm actually living my dream like this is what it's all about you know when my mom died I was, she died at 41 years old and I was like I have to live my life I have to live my life now because time is never guaranteed, you know? So yeah, I, it was really it was great, you know, that experience. So when I was done traveling through Europe, I met a lot of amazing people, saw all the places I wanted to see, you know? I booked a one-way ticket to Thailand because I heard, it, I heard it was a very easy place for tourists to go, you know? And wow, Asia. Was like nowhere else I've ever been. Thailand, especially Bangkok. I was like, this is crazy, man. 
I spent some time in Thailand and then I was able to go to uh, Australia on my birthday. I landed on my birthday. Uh, it was a crazy experience, man. I, uh, I landed at like 12 a.m. I checked into a hostel that had like roaches and like some weird people in there, you know? Like, oh my God, did I make a huge mistake? I'm on the other side of the world now. I'm, it's my birthday and like I'm in this disgusting hostel that is, you know, so gross. What am I doing here? But yeah, I, I was able to survive that night and uh, check into a nice, nicer, cleaner hostel. And yeah, my, my experience in Australia was amazing. I, uh, and I went in there thinking I'd have to work in cafes, have to work in restaurants, do things I'd never done before. Actually, it was crazy. I actually met somebody, an uh, amazing person who had a small recruitment company. So I ended up doing the same thing I was doing back home, a professional nine to five job back home. And I'm like, oh, really, this, this is amazing. I'm, I'm able to do like a professional job like I was doing back home. Now the, the working holiday visa, you only were allowed to work six months at a time. So uh, yeah, I, I was only allowed to work six months at that company and then I can work at another company for six months. But I ended up having such a good relationship with that person that you know he was able to find me in another job with his friend very easily. So I worked the whole time in the recruitment industry. Uh, made a lot of money over there, was able to save a bunch. You know, um, met some really amazing people in Australia. I'm still friends with them today. So, you know, and you know, I had a chance to actually stay in Australia. They wanted me to continue on with them. And to be, they wanted to sponsor my visa, a long-term visa there, to become like on the path towards permanent residency. It sucks to have friends back home that are going to get married though, because I had a friend who I don't regret it, who led me to where I am today. But I had to go back to Boston to be at my friend's wedding, and yeah, it really sucks. It's it like mixed feelings leaving Australia because I had such a comfortable, nice life there. And uh, yeah, I went back home to Boston to uh, be at my friend's wedding, which was a great experience. Um, I did some traveling to Puerto Rico, uh, Bahamas, and I did a lot of things there as well. But then I, I was like, I only have two more months left on my visa by that time in Australia. It didn't make sense for me to go all the way back across the world. It would be too expensive anyway. So I was like, I'm going to go somewhere where I don't know the language. The culture's not similar to America. And yeah, just start a new experience, maybe teach it. And that's what led me here in Vietnam. Um, so I started applying for jobs in Vietnam. I did another Euro trip before that, so I went through Europe again, saw some other countries, did some amazing things there. Went back to Thailand again, did the whole that whole thing again. But then I ended up in Vietnam and yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you about my Vietnam story because it's by far the best story that I've had. All right, so my Vietnam story is actually really great, man. Um, you know, I've been living here, and February was actually four years. It's been four years since I've been living in Vietnam. Um, when I first came to Vietnam, I was in Thailand. And I was applying for jobs, and um, I was a little worried because I didn't have any teaching experience and I didn't have a teaching certificate at the time. But I knew native speakers could get jobs in Vietnam. So after very little research, I found some place in a very, very, very small town in the north of Vietnam called Top Swan, which is in Tang Hoa province. And I was like, um, the person who hired me actually made it out to be a bigger place than it actually was. So, Landed, I got the visa, a year-long visa, uh, landed in Hanoi, and the person actually, um, the person from the company actually met me in Hanoi and have helped me get on the bus. It's a rat. <laughs> uh, helped me get on the bus and then go well, there. was a four or five hour bus ride to um, the place where I was staying. And let me tell you, this place was countryside. Like the, the, the typical like uh, rice paddies, like buffalo in the middle of the road, like 
very few people there, like, I was like, oh my god, this is, what have I gotten myself into? And I worked for a very, very, very small English center. But I was very thankful that I could actually get a job in a country where I didn't speak the language. You know? It was an amazing experience. It was a tiny, tiny startup. Uh, to this day, I'm still friends with the, you know, one of the ladies who started up the company. And uh, yeah, they provided me with a house. I had a whole house for myself. Um, you know, they gave me a good salary starting out. And it was very close to uh, my house, the house that I was in was very close to the center, so I was walking distance. I would regularly get invited for dinners, I'd regularly get you know, free food, you know, I'd you know, get help with everything. And yeah, I was able to take a bus to Hanoi every week if I wanted to, to go enjoy myself. You know? um, it was such an amazing experience, but after two months I was like, oh, I need, I need some more Liveliness. I'm a city guy, you know, I grew up in Boston, so I wanted to be part of the big city. And that's where I started my Hanoi English. I had applied to a company where I was with for three years called Apex English. And I had an amazing experience with them up until, you know, when I left. I started off as a teacher, you know, it's a big company, one of the biggest English centers in Vietnam. Started off as a teacher, got promoted to senior teacher, then immediately after that, I was a head teacher. I was running a center with 12 teachers underneath me, a thousand students. And then, yeah, I, I moved to Saigon after two years of living in Hanoi. And, yeah, I was in the head of corporate office. It happened so quickly. You know, when you're abroad, like, and you're in the English industry, like, things can happen as quick as you want them to. But yeah, that was, that was a great experience. Now I work for a really great company. I work for a university here teaching English. And, you know, my journey through work here is only part of my Vietnamese culture. You know, I met so many amazing people in this country and seen so many amazing places and done so many amazing things here in Vietnam. And it's like my home. You know, I've learned the language. You know, I've seen all the sites. I've been to so many cities in this amazing country. I've, most of my friends here in Vietnam are Vietnamese. You know, living here has helped me meet my fiance. You know? and, um, I couldn't be any happier than my time here. Um, life in Vietnam has taught me that life in America is just so uptight and so so much pressure from everything in America that living here is just feel free. You know, I don't have that burden. Uh, feeling like I'm being stereotyped, or that I'm being uh, racially profiled, or that I'm being watched all the time. In America, sometimes it's hard to walk into a store without being stared at or followed. Here, that doesn't happen. People greet you with a smile, and they treat you like anyone else. I'm just as different living here as a white person, or as a Latino person. You know? And that's an amazing feeling. It's, I can't describe it. You know, it's just such a calm and peaceful feeling. You just, as expats, no matter where you're from, you're treated with open arms in Vietnam. The Vietnamese people are so curious. And sure, you, you might get uncomfortable when they stare at you, but they're like, oh, you know, people look different. I, I'll never forget this one time in that small, tiny town in the north of Vietnam, I was on one of the local buses. And, old Vietnamese lady had asked my colleague, is he from China? Because she didn't know. She didn't know what people looked like from America or people looked like from other countries, you know? So that was, that was a very interesting thing. And it let me know like how curious people are here. Yeah, um, Vietnamese, living in Vietnam has taught me how cheap everything is in comparison to the U.S. as well. Um, and how much better, how much more money you can save, and how much better of a lifestyle you can have as well. And I think, yeah, I'd love to talk about some of the benefits of living abroad. Um, yeah, so, living abroad has taught me so many things. There's so many lessons that I've learned while living abroad. First lesson is patience. 
you gotta, you know, I was a very impatient person. I wanted things done all the time, just like most Americans do. But living abroad has taught me that things are not going to go your way. If you don't speak the language in the country that you're in, it's, it's still not going to go your way. You know, it's, it's going to take even longer. So living abroad has taught me to be very patient. Um, you know, I remember one time I was in India. And in India, things can go wrong very quickly, you know? I was on a, on a, I was waiting for a train. It was supposed to be a four hour journey. Uh, from, I think it was Jaipur to Jaipur. And I was waiting for the train, blah, blah, blah. The recording comes on saying that the train was delayed by 30 minutes. So 30 minutes turned into two hours, turned into seven hours seven hour delay. At that point you can't do anything. And then from Udaipur to Mumbai I was I was supposed to have a, a bus take me there. And yeah, uh, it was supposed to be a short journey. The bus broke down in the middle of the night. I was at a rest stop in the middle of the night for two or three hours to wait for the next bus to come by. And it's just like, wow, what can you do? You get frustrated, you get really angry, you get mad, you get scared, you like so many emotions, but then at one point, after the third or fourth hour, it just feels calm. Because you can't do anything after. So yeah, patience is the number one lesson. Uh, for me, the next important lesson, I believe, is adaptability. You learn how to adapt to your surroundings, you know? At first, when I first came to Vietnam, I was surprised at how many motorbikes there were. I was like, this must be the most polluted, most dangerous place to drive. You know? I'm a freaking expert at driving on two wheels. I find it more convenient than driving a car. Is it dangerous? Yes, it's still dangerous. But I could drive on sidewalks, I could drive the other way, I could drive all different places, and yeah, it's just, it's actually a freer experience. Never stuck in traffic, very rarely you are. But yeah, like, now I've adapted to, um, you know, you adapt to different climates, you adapt to not knowing the language. I learned the language in order to understand more. You adapt to different cultures, you know? There's so many different cultural differences around the world that you adapt to, that are very important. And yeah, um, adaptability is huge. You get really, really good, like I said, with languages. So, you know, I know how to say hello and simple count numbers and close to 10 languages. Uh, you meet people from all over the world. So, yeah, it's, they teach you a lot of things. Um, Another lesson that I've learned is how to be really, really good with negotiation. You learn a lot of negotiation skills a little bit You go to a local market, but as a foreigner, the price is going to be higher than the need. So, yeah, I mean, you learn how to negotiate this, all your stuff down a bit. Another benefit of living abroad is just a simple cost factor. I mean, here in Vietnam, I, I had one place. Obviously that was free, you know, paid for by the company. But also in Hanoi, I had a place that was $125 a month to rent. Name one place in America where you can do that. You can't. You know, right now I live in a, in a high rise on the 17th floor with my fiance, and we pay 600 bucks a month. So it's a really fancy, nice building, only 600 bucks a month. Right? And we split that two ways, so 300 bucks a month. It's crazy how much you can save here. Coffee, which I just had, you know, before this, was 50 cents. You know, you can have a meal here for less than a dollar. You know, and it's probably more delicious than any dollar meal you'll get in Big Dollar. It's probably better for you, too. Um, yeah, and that's a you know, simple cost benefit. You know, things like gasoline is cheaper here. Things like, uh, you know, getting around transportation. Um, Traveling. The domestic travel in the U.S. is like more expensive than international travel. Here, I, I think you can fly from one city to the other for less than thirty dollars sometimes. Round trip. Um, especially with you know you can fly to different countries cheap too. Um, living abroad, yeah, the, the costs are definitely lower than in America. Um, the simple fact that people are more welcoming here, I think it's a benefit alone as well. Less racist people, you know, I think that's a huge benefit. You feel, you know, 
like traveling, you can be whoever you want to be. I definitely am more outgoing. I'm definitely more extroverted. I'm definitely more confident since I've left abroad. You get more life experience by living abroad. Um, lessons that you learn that you can never learn by staying in your little bubble in your town or your city in America, you learn by living abroad. And yeah, I mean, it's just something that, you know, like I, I want to continue doing for the rest of my life. I don't want to move back home because of all the benefits that I'm getting here. You know, I've gotten into things like, uh, you know, like uh, I've learned about myself spiritually. I've learned about myself, uh, you know, physically. You know, I've learned about myself socially, and just in so many different ways that it's just so hard to do that. Home, you know? But yeah, um, yeah, you learn a lot by living abroad in that sense. Um, and other benefits, small benefits, you get to try the most amazing food all over. Fresh, amazing food. I mean, I'm a big foodie, so. I love to try new foods, like, I've never tried it before, let me try it, you know, this, 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 and that. Right? You get really good with photography, you get really good with uh, exchange rates, math, simple math stuff, you know, that improves. Um, some other benefits. Um, yeah, I mean, you get to see amazing places for much cheaper than you would back home. Like a flight from here to Thailand is only 100 bucks round trip. You know, from Boston to Thailand is unaffordable. You know? uh, yeah, and then seeing places within that country is super cheap too. Like I've been to Halong Bay, I've been to um, you know, Hazan Lu, like lots of beautiful places up north in Vietnam, and then the tropical islands, tropical beaches, for a fraction of the cost. Uh, so there are some negatives to living abroad. The biggest thing I would say is obviously the language barrier. It can be nice sometimes because if people are talking crap about you, you don't know. And ignorance is bliss. It's great, right? But yeah, I mean, it also provides a lot of frustration sometimes when you don't understand what you're talking about. Um, and yeah, simple things like even getting around or uh, finding a place to park or asking about the price sometimes can be very challenging. Especially healthcare, healthcare is another thing. America has great healthcare, but it's unaffordable. Here, the healthcare is affordable, but not as great. So, that's one thing I do worry about sometimes. Um, you know, there's some pollution here is really bad. The traffic here is very dangerous. In some other parts of the world, it is very dangerous. So, it is something you have to watch out for. Um, and there are, like, some things that you will see that will. I wouldn't call it necessarily a disadvantage because it humbles you. But it is something that brings you back down to reality. You know, I've seen people that have, they're victims of Agent Orange, for example. You know, people with deformities that if they were back home or if they were in America, they could get fixed and you know, have somewhat of a normal life. But here they can't. You, know, you see people who have disabilities that are on the side of the road breathing in all the exhaust fumes trying to sell little, you know, money, you know, sell, like, uh, lotto tickets and stuff. It's just, like, that's so hard to watch and look at. You know, my Vietnamese friends have told me that there are kids, especially, that are selling things that are part of, like, a bigger ring, you know, like, similar to what was in Slumdog Millionaire, where they're, they're begging for money, but then that money goes to some drug dealer or some human trafficker. So you want to help them, but you can't. I mean, that's tough. You know, to watch it. Um, you know, there's petty crime all over the world, but there are no guns here. So, overall, you just feel safer. Yeah. Uh, the biggest piece of advice that I would give somebody moving abroad is to just go. <laughs> that's all it takes. You know, I, you have to come up with a goal in mind of what you want to do. So I wouldn't say, oh, I'm just going to live in Dubai, for example, and yeah, that's going to be it. No, you need to really research as well. You know, research the place you want to go to, and then come up with a uh, savings goal in mind, and then, you know, like, just book the ticket. Everything will fall in line once you book the ticket. You know, 
that's what happened with me. Once I got the visa, I booked a ticket to Australia, and then I had a set date in mind of when I was leaving. You know? I was like, okay, by this date, I'm leaving. I have to save money by this time. So when people are in a time, you know, like a time crunch in general, they usually perform better. Think about this, whenever you had an exam or something, you know, if you're a crammer like me, you're gonna cram, 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 and, you know, the night before that you can perform the next day. Well, if you have a shortened amount of time especially, you're gonna cram, 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 you do everything you can in order to make that ticket, and make that trip happen. Uh, it's not easy, but once you do it, it's such a freeing and more, the most rewarding experience. Um, there will be a lot of people that question what you, your plans are, what you want to do. My advice to you is to trust your heart, trust your instinct, and I've learned to go with the flow of life. I, I used to be a big planner. I used to be somebody who plans everything in my life. But now I'm just like, wherever the wind takes me, I'm going to do it. Um, there are benefits, but there are also disadvantages to it. But I'd say the benefits outweigh the disadvantages. The naysayers out there will keep on telling you, no, this is a stupid idea, no this, no that. But no one can live your life for you. Only you can live your life. And just remember that time is not guaranteed to anybody. I can get on my bike now get into a huge accident and die. But I can honestly say now, at this point, I've lived a happy life. You know, I've heard that most people in America, especially on their deathbed or whatever, the biggest regret that they have is not traveling the world. They live until they're 65 to retire, and then they can't do anything with their life after. I'm living my dream now. I don't want to be 65, 70 years old and have all this money that I saved up and just live in a retirement home and live in Florida and do nothing but I want to live my life to the fullest now because tomorrow is never promised. You may think it is, but it's not. So leave, come up with a goal, you gotta do it and don't listen to people who tell you no no no. Tell yourself yes. There are a lot of obviously tough experiences, you know, there's a lot. Um, you know, there's obviously the, the situation in Australia where <laughs> I, you know, moved it halfway across the world and felt like, oh my god, what happened because I was in a hostel full of cockroaches and all that stuff. That was pretty bad, but generally speaking, I've had a really nice time living abroad. There was one instance where I did feel racism in Australia. So I had an Indian roommate and a Japanese roommate in my uh, flat in Australia. And we all decided, us three wanted to go out to a, a very popular like uh, bar that I normally go to by myself or with other friends, you know? And I don't know, I just, we were waiting in line, waiting, 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 and these three girls were in front of us. The place was not full at all. It's never full, it's a big place. And you know, these three girls were let in before us, and I was like, I showed up in this place that the bouncers remember my face, they know me, but then I had my Indian Japanese friend with me, and they were like, no, you guys can't come in, we're all full. I was like, what? I was, I was shocked. I was like, what do you mean we can't come in? You know? It's not full, you just let three people in. There are three girls behind us as well, and they're like, yeah, you guys should let them in because you let three girls in front of us, in front of people. It took a lot of, like, uh, us going back and forth with the bouncers. And I was like, I can't believe this is happening. I feel like I'm back home in America, you know? And it's because I, I felt like it was just like we were being racially profiled because we were a combination that didn't match. It's like, why is a black guy, an Indian guy, and a Japanese guy, why are they hanging out for me? And I was like, it was crazy, because I think one of the bouncers was actually either black or aboriginal, I can't remember, and one was white. And then, yeah, they just were, wouldn't let us in. And I think it was more so being racist towards my Indian friend and my Japanese friend. Like, this is crazy, do I even want to go in here? You know, we, we ended up being let in, you know, out of them feeling bad for us or realizing their mistake, but then we left like five minutes after. It's like, why did we go through that? We shouldn't have to go through that. 
our night was just brutal. Though. That was a tough experience for me to do. Uh, but no, I've never lost a passport, never lost or been anything stolen from me, you know, never had any experience like that. Um, most of my experiences, I mean, I wouldn't really call the delays as the worst experience, but yeah, I mean, the racist thing was, I think, to date, the hardest thing to work with. Because it's like, I left America to get away from this, and I felt it. For, like I said, for advice as well, not only just, you know, coming up with a plan, a place, and a goal saving school, but also, uh, just not being afraid. Your life will be better abroad. No question, as long as you're open minded, you have to be open minded to travel. Um, and even if you're a little closed minded now, as long as you're open minded to a new experience, your life is going to change significantly and for the better. Uh, for those of you in tougher communities in America, you know, especially uh, low income communities or communities where you think you're trapped or you feel like there's no way out, there is. There is. Especially, you know, fellow African Americans, you know, you have to go abroad. You know, just far too often I see only a certain type of person traveling from our country. And it's very sad because I feel like us African Americans will benefit more from being abroad. Not only are, you know, you're still treated the same as anyone else, especially in Asia. But also, like, you'll get out of that constant cycle of black oppression in America. You know, like, I have a job here where I'm getting paid the same, not less, the same as a white person, if not more. I live comfortably. I don't live in a, in a, in a place where I feel like my life is in danger. The police here, they treat me the same, but just as a white person, just as another Vietnamese person, they treat me the same. I don't feel a constant fear of being pulled over on my bike at gunpoint, or tackled and arrested, or followed, or anything like that. You know? There's no gang violence here where you, as a foreigner, need to worry. None of that exists. You know? You, you meet people from around the world, like even European countries, that look at you for who you are, not the color of your skin. More, when you meet people abroad, they're more open-minded. Other people are more open-minded. Um, I've met some amazing people around the world that, you know, as a, as a black person, you might feel a little, I guess, maybe nervous, or I don't know what the right word is, maybe apprehensive, how they're going to think of you, but they treat you with open arms, and especially black women. You know, I think that you all should travel more and see what else is out there. Sure, it's inconvenient. You know, maybe there are things you can't find back home that you know that are comforts. But you know, you'd be also surprised at what how many other expats are here. You know, from other countries. You know, like. Like there's so many, like in Hanoi, there's a whole African community there. There's a huge African community here. And you'd be surprised what kind of products you can find. You'd be surprised what kind of stories you can hear from those people as well. Uh, you can live vicariously through them, you know, get in touch with roots, you know, that you may not know. I was surprised to meet some Haitian people in Hanoi. I was like, oh my god, my brother, what's going on? It's not saying, man. You know, they, they study in the university there. So it's like, it is possible, and uh, more often than not, you know, it's it's African people who are traveling. Whereas we should send more African Americans. You'll learn more about the world. You'll be more, um, I guess, culturally uh, aware of things, and you'll learn more, like educationally, about life by traveling abroad. But you might not have that access to the world. Very important, I think, for the African American community to travel. 
Yeah, so um, there's tons of media out there. I mean, travel blogging has blown up since I left. It's huge now. You know, I had thought about doing it um, at the time, but I'm not the type of person to sit in front of my computer all day or go like this on a video camera. I am not. Even this right now is a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, um, the guy that I followed, you know, helped inspire me to be on this journey. Um, it's Drew Binsky. He's got Snapchat. He's got um, he's got Instagram, he's got a YouTube channel, he's really big, he's an American guy, a little bit younger than me, he helped inspire me a lot, um, there's this girl, uh, I forget her name, but her Instagram's called My Life's a Travel Movie, I followed her a lot as well, um, there's a really good, uh, there's a really good, uh, travel blogger, she's an African American, called Onika, Onika, but, um, the Wanderer, I believe, yeah, she's got a really great travel blog as well. Um, the book that I read was called Vagabonding. Huge. Yeah. By Ralph Potts, I believe. Uh, it was huge. It was huge, huge motivation. Um, there's another book that I read when I had my time in Australia about a guy who um, rode his uh, motorbike uh, from Australia to England. It's just a, such an amazing story, like how he went from each country. Can't no, like there's this guy for foodies, there's a really good uh, travel blogger that I watch. Uh, his name's Mark Weens, and his, uh, his travel blog is called Migrationology. If you're a foodie like me, you gotta follow this guy. He's, he's huge. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, all his stuff, uh, Parts Unknown, the Parts Unknown, and then uh, uh, there was another, yeah, No Reservations, like that. That one is huge. Um, yeah, you just get your eyes open man, to so many things while watching these guys. Like, oh, especially if you're similar in age. But yeah, I can do this. This is not something that's difficult. Traveling is not that expensive. If you plan properly, if you're good with money, it's, it, it doesn't have to be expensive. There's things like couchsurfing.com where you can stay for free in other countries. As long as you have personality and can write a nice message, you can stay on somebody's couch for free. Uh, for women, I just be careful a little bit. There are some guys who use it as a dating site. That's, that's very true. But yeah, uh, you know there are tons of hosts around the world that will host you on their couch or even rooms for free. So there's one cost right there. Hostelworld.com, my favorite website to book places. Um, Skyscanner.com, great for finding cheap deals. Uh, there's uh, there are other, like, there's other resources online uh, where you can find travel deals that cut for prices. Obviously, the pandemic is going to have a big issue with traveling for now, but, you know, once that, once this goes away, hopefully within the next few years, I want to see travel blooming. I can't wait to get out of here and go on my next international trip. I'm dying for it. So, yeah, I'm, traveling's my passion, and it's just something that part of me. This was the, has been the first full year of living in Vietnam and not traveling abroad. You know, I've been to Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. I've been to um, China, Japan, uh, Myanmar, India, Nepal, all from here. And yeah, it's, it's a great place to go around the world. It's, travel can be as cheap as you want it to be. You just have to be smart. Live to, learn to let go. That's one enough, I'm sorry, another thing that I learned especially is to let go. Let go of your prejudice, let go of your discrimination, let go of your preconceived notions of what the rest of the world is like and just go to experience it. You also learn to let go of your things, your material things. When I was talking to you about uh, leaving Miami and selling all my stuff, it's hard to let go of all these things that you love, your personal things, you know? You get to prioritize your life better. And you see how letting go will help you move on and better yourself as a person in life. So yeah, letting go is another thing. That's, that's another advantage of living abroad um, is that it's incredibly easy to start a business here. Um, especially in Vietnam. A lot of like expenses that you would normally have back home are just 
quarter of the cost here. For example, renting a place to start a business. Let's say you want to start an English center. It's so incredibly cheap to do so in comparison to back home. Also, I mean, Asia in general is an entrepreneurial heaven. You go to a place like China, you go to places like Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, you can set up a business overnight. You know, like, if I want, I've done private tutoring before. There's no, no need to report it to the government. There's no need to do any of that. You just, you know, you post something on Facebook, people hit you up, locals. And then you charge whatever you want. Online teaching is huge here, you know, digital nomad life. Since the, the cost of living is so low here, you can, if you have an online job, you can really live a real comfortable life here. Um, also, a lot of times people may think, oh, I can only live abroad if my company sends me there. It's true, sometimes a company will send you there, but there's no need. You know, you can get to any country that you want and find a job there. There are certain countries that have stricter visas and requirements. But like I was telling you, in, in Australia, for example, they wanted to be the sponsor they wanted to sponsor my visa there and put me on a path towards permanent residency. In Australia, for example, there are only 23 million people that live in that country. It's the size of the United States. They're very like uh, foreign workforce friendly there, or they have, they were at least when I was working there, because they don't have enough people to work with. My boss told me that they really want people from the UK and the US for sales, for example, because Australian people in general are less pushy when it comes to sales. America and the UK, people are very uh, aggressive with sales and very good with it. You know? so, especially in the recruitment industry, they want people there because they simply don't have the workforce there. If you are somebody who's in technology, you can get a job anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. Uh, I used to do tech recruitment and yeah, in Australia, we get people from India, we get people from uh, Vietnam, we got people from other places in Europe. Uh, we got places, people from America to come over and work on the show. You can work anywhere in the world as long as you know coding. Um, if you're into art, if you're into like creative things, you can rent out a coffee shop, you can rent out a design studio for the day and have an exhibit. People will come and pay for it. You know, like, I think for only $120,000, you can set up your own business and like get registered here in Vietnam amazing because you can sponsor yourself to have residency here, which is incredible. Uh, you know, buying property here, there's something I'm thinking about doing my fiance, is so much cheaper than buying an American startup place. And yeah, there's a lot of potential here. Given that Vietnam has the pandemic under control, business as usual here, you know, uh, you know they have a developing nation that's not being thwarted by the pandemic. There's a lot of opportunity here in Asia. And yeah, I mean, I don't know, the benefits, I can go on and on about the benefits of living abroad. Yeah, definitely like living costs, setting up your own business, getting paid well in proportion to the living costs of you know, you can, I've saved more money living here in Vietnam than I ever would back home, and I made more money back home. How does that math make sense? You know? My journey has been a five-year journey. It started from just an idea, you know, just an idea from coming back and really being miserable at, at home, back in my office job, to now looking at, for example, buying property in a foreign country. You know, but, like I'm still living my dream. I'm living my dream, not the American dream. My dream. It's great that have an American passport, it opens a lot of doors. I never want to give up my citizenship. I love my country. I still watch news every day to keep, uh, I guess, uh, keep close ties with what's happening in America. But yeah, like, having that freedom to move and live abroad is something that I want all of you to know you can do and is super beneficial. Home is never going to go away. Your, your home will always be there. The people you love will always be there. I stay in contact with my friends back home and family back home all the time. I'll try and visit as often as I can, maybe once every two years. I'll definitely go back home even sooner. But yeah, uh, living abroad has taught me lessons in life I would never learn back home. 
my advice to everyone is just to go. I mean, it'll be the best decision you ever make in your life. I love this quote by, these two quotes that I love, that I just want to leave you with. Uh, the first one is, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And then, travel is the only thing you buy that makes you richer. I'm richer with life experience and happiness, not money. You, know? you definitely spend money while traveling, but it's all money well spent. And then, you just need to take that first step to realize your goals. And I couldn't be happier than I My mental health is better, my physical health, my social life is better, my confidence is up. And yeah, I'm just comfortable. If you want to live a comfortable life, have some time abroad. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is Leave the Dream. Uh, I started in 2015 when I uh, left the American Dream. I try and post, you know, every every couple months. But yeah, I mean, if you guys want to see, I started posting when I uh, left America, and you can see, you know, some of the pictures around my the, the countries I've been to around the world and my journey to this point. Now. So yeah. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Abe, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. All right, so what an amazing story we've had by Lee. I hope that you're able to take something away from this, uh, this, the interview that we've had today with him, and run with it. If you like this content, please consider hitting the like button and subscribing, and even hitting the notification bell so that you're notified when, we do, when I do release more videos. Uh, until the next time that we see each other, until the next time I release a video, I hope you stay safe, stay awesome, and plan that first trip. Talk to you soon.